Hi, my name is Sheila. I'm a member of the Seniors Program at Rexdale Community Center. And today I'm going to tell you my story. Coming to Canada was a blessing to us. So my husband, he said, I think we should go to Canada. So, but I saw those mountains of uh, snow. I said, how could that be? <laughs> In those days, streetcar tickets were four for a dollar. And daily I would go downtown looking for jobs. I was born in Uganda in March 1936. And a couple of people in my village died in one of the ships that were torpedoed. My mother also sacrificed a lot. Entonces tuve que viajar en un camión con ella, agarradas en la parte de atrás. And some people were shocked. How you could move your horse? I said, well, it was wood. And being from India, and you have a daughter, and somebody asked to get them married, get them married. We have no say. But now, I will never say that to anybody at that age. My name is Esther Oyewumi. I'm a Nigerian by birth, but now I'm a Canadian. <laughs> My name is Joy Herman Stein, and I'm going to tell you the story about coming to Canada. In the year 1973, a beautiful young lady left the shores of Georgetown, Guyana, wearing a floral cotton dress to come to Toronto, Canada for a better life and future. It was springtime when I arrived, but I felt as though I was in the Northwest Territory. I was so cold and I wanted to return home immediately. In Guyana, Guyana is a tropical country. And so we have beautiful sunny days in the expected May, June rain and sporadic rainfall during the year. So this was foreign to me. I just wanted to go back home, but I was persuaded to stay. In those days, streetcar tickets were four for a dollar. And daily I would go downtown looking for jobs focusing on insurance company, banks, and hospitals. All you had to do was just fill out an application form and they'll phone you back. So I got two offers. One for the Bank of Nova Scotia and the other one was for North American Life. I took the latter because the pay was better. Then real life began. I moved into a big old house on Spring Horse, a room. The food, food was, the rent was affordable. Food was inexpensive, and I had enough money left to go to Fairweather to shop trendy clothes. At the insurance company, I became friends with Margarita, a Jamaican girl, and she would say to me, Joy, you're beautiful. Air Canada is hiring black flight attendants. Why don't you apply? And I was insecure and timid, and I didn't want to do it, but she kept persisting. So after much coercion, I decided to apply. Meanwhile, at the insurance company, trouble started. My supervisor, Nita, was a bully. And again, I was new in the country, and I did not have the skills to handle her, so she fired me. While on unemployment, I enrolled in George Brown College. And about a year and a half later, Air Canada hired me. I, was, I had to go from, to Montreal for training. The training was about five weeks. I took successfully completed the training and was based in Montreal. And that was the year of the Olympics, 1976. Being a junior flight attendant, we did mostly short flights or night hawks, flying all night. So I did a lot of Toronto, Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, <laughs> Rapid Air. And yes, I've been to Sudbury, Timmins, North Bay, <laughs> and Calgary, and Edmonton. 
Guyana was a former British colony and so daily we would listen to programs from BBC. The news, soap opera, especially one Portia Faces Life, or a crime series called Then They Taught by the Mistakes They Made. And then we didn't have TV. So daily you see grown men sitting around transistor radio listening to cricket match from Lord's Cricket Ground or betting on Manchester United. So while on my layover, I went to like Regent Street and Buckingham Palace and Marks and Spencer. It was like coming home. After I accrued seniority, the world started to open up to me. I've been to India, to the Taj Mahal, China, walked did the walls, Singapore, been to the largest church in Singapore. I've been to many, many, many places. <laughs> Brazil. Well, in Amsterdam, we went to the red light district. And there, <laughs> young women were like China dolls behind a big glass window just waiting to be purchased. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, in Singapore, a little boy came up to me. I don't know, maybe this is the first time he saw a black person. He came up to me and just, just rubbed my skin. In Paris, we went to Notre Dame and the Eiffel Tower and to the University District and sitting outside, everybody eats outside in Paris in the summertime. And this guy just walked along, took one of my French fries, smiled and continued. <laughs> the journey I've undertaken so far has not always been easy. There were periods of fear and lack and sickness and heartbreak because I trusted my own wisdom and understanding. I didn't have the solution. I couldn't solve the problems. But everywhere along the, my path, God would send somebody, a divine helper, that would assist me. There was a time I went to work and I didn't have enough money to come, come back home. In those days we were allowed to take tips and the lady gave me more than enough as a tip. Yeah, mistakes, mistakes, <laughs> I made a few. Yeah, when I bought my first house, I was not equipped. I was not prepared for all the extra bills. <laughs> I'm it's sure not... you're right. <laughs> <laughs> We're not equipped. <laughs> it's the extras, you know? And so I had to sell the house. When I sold the house, I lost $40,000. I owed the bank $40,000. So we went into the MSTD and they decided to write off $20,000. If I could give the other 20 in 48 hours, again, God did it. <laughs> At one time, all we had in the fridge was those bottles and the door, the mayonnaise and the ketchup, <laughs> and the ketchup, those things, no food. And food banks were not accessible as they are today. I mean, every corner you could find a food bank. The kids went to church that Sunday. I can't remember why I didn't go. But they came home with an, with an envelope. A member sent $500 for me. <laughs> God is good. <laughs> I did not want to get back. I was adamant about not getting back into the, into the housing market. And one day on a flight from Tel Aviv, I met this lady and she was a real estate agent. See, God uses people to guide you, you know? And as we were having this conversation, she said to me, the one thing that really impressed me about Israel is the way people value real estate. The land was important to them. So I told her my story and she said, you should get back. Timidly, I went back, I got a condo, and then I sold the condo, and now I live in a detached house in Rick's. God is good. And so every time I would tell people about this story, and that would encourage them that you can do it, you know, move on. Mind you, when I was getting this house, oh, I, I think I sent the real estate guy crazy. He had to send things, <laughs> because I was prepared now. 
I knew where I wanted to live, some place that was close to the bus stop, some place that was close to church and home. So I took the time, you know, and I did my homework. And so I'm happy. I've learned from the past. And I've learned that you gotta be good to people. You know, once, let me tell you about this time. Once on a flight, I met this lady. I was coming from London to Toronto. And she was going to the States via Toronto. And so she had a terrible backache. I did everything. I put hot water in a, in a bottle, in a water bottle, give her to put on her back. Not supposed to do that. Because if she gets in, the, I did everything. When we got to Toronto, she missed her flight. We didn't have money for the hotel. So I said, well, you could come. Don't know the lady. Oh, you could come to my house. <laughs> so I took the lady home. Thank God. She was good. And the next morning, I took her back to the airport. Yeah. And she got her flight. She was coming. <laughs> Uh, she was going, going to live to this, in the States with, to be with her husband. Anyways, look at this. We kept in touch. And about two years ago, it was her husband's 60th birthday and she invited me. They paid my hotel. They had me put, put me up in their house for two days and paid my hotel bill for two more days. See, <laughs> gotta be good to people. Came right back to Came you. Came right back yeah, another but time. How many years? Heart. Yeah, it took it took a while, but they never forgot. Yeah. People don't forget when you're good to them. There was another man. He, all I did was show him the way through the airport, and then he said to me, "Well, where is the duty free store?" So I showed him. I took him to the duty free store. He came out with a bottle of Joy perfume and a hundred dollars, and he said, "Thank you." There's the white perfume. <laughs> Yeah, there is a joy perfume, very expensive. Yes. It's good to serve God. It's good to be good to people. Help people whenever you can. You know, Mahalia Jackson sang this song, if I can help somebody, then my life will be worth living. You know? Yes, not everybody would be grateful. But still, you gotta do, be not weary in well-doing. Gotta help people, you gotta do it. My name is Angela Bachan, and this is my story. Coming to Canada was a blessing to us. We promised my daughter when she did well at home in her examination, we will give her a trip abroad because I had a bigger daughter here. And uh, she did well. I bring her to Canada on vacation. When she come, she liked the place. She also had an air infection. So we started to take her to doctors. We paid and whatever, and he gave us samples, and she started to feel better. Then my daughter put in our papers, and it take about nine to 10 months, and we get landed. My daughter had to get an air infection, um, an air operation. And after that, I sent her to school. She went to George Harvey. She did well. She topped the school in maths and English in three months. She got a bonus from CIBC. The teacher, he tell me, he said this child, he would take care of her as if she is his child because she did so well and she's so well mannered. So he signed her up to Humber College. I just had to go and pay the fees. She did well. She worked for Paramount when she was 19 years old as an accountant. From there, she moved to Alliance. Now she's working for E1 as an accountant. So, and as for me, I did odd jobs so that I can support 
me and her. After many years, then I get to work with the Ontario Food Terminal. And that is where I worked for 21 years. I worked there, it was hard. I did everything possible to make her happy. Then she gets her partner. We bought the house. When she started, he, she continued with school. I had to sell the house and I bought this condo right down the street here. And now after 21 years, I retired and I'm happy. When I, when I got the work at the food terminal, I went there and from the time I went there to work, there was the assistant supervisor was a Jamaican girl and the supervisor was a white lady. But she was very short and she was friendly. And she said to me, she said, Angela, you talk very quiet. You know what, when you're talking, you have to raise your voice because it have lots of machinery going by. She say, and um, then the assistant supervisor tell her, don't tell Angela how to talk, let she be herself. Gradually, she will fall into it and she would get to know everybody. And working in a place like that, it wasn't nice. But I put myself forward, I say, you know what, I left home and come, and I have to have money to go back and visit and come back and go back and visit. Remember my, my husband there and my son there, and me and my daughter here with the other one. And uh, we went so for all the years, and when I started to work for my own money and I seen I'm making progress in life here, I didn't want to go back to Trinidad to live. And you're free here, you can, Sometimes we finish work like 10 o'clock in the night. I can take the bus and come freely home. Nobody telling me anything but home, you can't do that. So I said no. And then I bought my house. When I bought my house, I feel so happy because I say, Lord, after five years, I work in Canada and I could buy a house. And it was a four bedroom house. And when well, my daughter was working for Paramount too, and with both of us, we did well. And then she come and she get her partner. We have to sell the house because I couldn't take care of it. So I sell it. I give her half of the profit. I pay out for the mortgage and I buy my condo. And I'm living and I am here and I'm so happy. And everybody tell me they're very proud of me being a mother, come here with a child. And I always tell my daughter, don't ask nobody for nothing. And anybody ask you if they can get this for you or get that for you, no. If I can get it this week, I get next week. And if not next week, I can get it next month. So don't ask nobody for nothing. Yeah, sometimes I go to work and you have a hard time at work, you know, people quarreling with you, people from all different countries come and they're working with us and they always you know you just doesn't want to see this to be done but I didn't know if you have your portion I have to do my portion I will work until the work is finished so they started to take advantage and then my assistant supervisor tell me no Angela don't do that it's advantage they're taking on you and when you stop helping Oh boy, it was trouble. I never tell them nothing. I used to come home, I used to go to my prayer room and how I talking to you, I used to talk to God. And I used to get that strength to go back again in the morning and work. And my supervisor, she was nice to me from the beginning. She used to help me a lot. She used to tell me, Angela, anything you want, she tell me everything about the status in work, what you can get, what you can't get, what you're liable for. And I used to just say, thank you. 
if I say something and like somebody get you like angry and you say something to them, if I come home I can't sleep. I have to pray over that and let that get out of me. Because I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say those things, you know. Though somebody's hurting you, you don't have to hurt back. And that's the way I am. I learn a lot over there and the way I meet people there, I think like whole of Canada, people was just like them. But then when you start to move out and meet other people, people is different. And my God, when I joined Rexdale Community Centre, the day I step my foot into that building, I meet Miriam Moreno. I met Leal, Tanya, and somebody again, Dale. And they make you feel so homely that when you walk over there, you think that you walk into this building. And the environment was so good that they didn't even think about the other side, you know. I leave that part and come on this side. People were so friendly. And how many years are you over here in this community? I will go to school, I will take my education, I'll try and stand up to my parents and tell them education is better than getting married. Because I was married when I was 16. Because my mom and dad, they knew these people from since my grandparents' days. and My grandfather was from India. So my father-in-law and mother-in-law, they used to have garden next to my grandfather. So they knew the family. So when my husband see me going to school, he went and tell my mother he wants to get married. And my father went and tell his father. And being from India, and you have a daughter, and somebody asked to get them married, get them married. We have no say, but now, I will never say that to anybody at that age. I want you to get your education. When you have your education, nobody can take that from you. So I just preach that to my children every day. My grandchildren, I just tell them the same thing. Don't do it. You want to have a great life? You try your best to do the right thing. You don't rush to say, well, you know, this this will make me happy and that would make, if I get this, it will make me happy. If I get that, no. Material things is out of it. Once you have spirituality, everything's just falling. And you have contentment. That is the biggest, biggest and best thing can ever happen to you. If you eat a sandwich and I could go and have a lavish lunch, my stomach is just as filled as yours. There is this old man and woman in the village. They never had no children, but in the late years, they come and have a baby boy. But he was so spoiled that the whole village, you know, they just like him. And this boy come out to be so evil. He was so wicked. He had bad behavior. He was rude to everybody. Even in school, when he started school, he would be rude to the teachers. He would bully the children. They called the parents to school. The parents said they don't know what to do. So the head of the village, they went and they talked to him and he told them what to do. So the dad went and he get a board, he get some nails and he get a hammer. And he bring it, he nail it on the wall and he tell his son, he said, come, how many times you get angry for the day? 
He said many times, because he's proud of himself. He said many times. He said, well, look, this is this nails and this hammer and that board. I want you, every time you get angry, you take a nail and nail it on that board. Not too long after, all the nails were finished. The board had no more space. So he tell his dad, he said, well, all the nails is finished. His dad said, well, now I want you to take out all those nails. So he went, he take out all those nails. He said, so I, dad, I take it off. What to do now? He said, go and get the board back how it was. So he went trying, 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 trying. He can't get it back how it was. So his dad called him and tell him, sit down. He said, you see what you did to that board? That is what you just do to people. You tell them hurtful things, you hurt them and that will stay with them. So he said, Dad, what can I do? He said, I want you to go and apologize to everybody. He went, he apologized to everybody. He dad said, kneel and pray about it. When he kneeled and he prayed, and he went back to the backyard, the entire board was smooth. So it was a miracle. He learned a lesson there. Don't hurt people because it stays with them. So be careful what you say to people. Be nice. When you're humble, everything would be okay. So he turned out to be a good boy. My name is Rebecca Dinka. Uh, it's nice to be here with you people. And uh, I'm always happy to talk. <laughs> I am good, good talk if they listen to me. But these days, some people, they don't bother to listen. <laughs> but that's okay. Well, I was born in, shall I say? I was born in Baghdad. Uh, so I met my husband there. Uh, there were lots of ups and downs, not to marry a foreigner, not to, you know, this and that, because it was in the Middle East. And uh, then I came to England. Uh, we stayed in England um, 10 years later, and uh, there were a lot of uh, advertising for they need people to Canada, and uh, they were, you know, there were a lot of advertising. So my husband, he said, I think we should go to Canada. So, but I saw those mountains of uh, snow. I said, how could that be? <laughs> so anyway, he came, his company, sent him here to Canada. We came to Canada and uh, actually he came three months before me uh, to, he bought, the, he purchased the house. So I came, I came uh, just because we were British subject. Uh, I didn't have to wait for immigration or anything. We just, you know, took my, uh, ticket, purchased the tickets, and I came. I came, he had already bought the house. So I knew, and then winter came. It's such a bit, I said, what the heck, what did we do? <laughs> anyway, we stayed, he worked, and uh, I took it care of the kids. And uh, after we lost the big business, we lost the big business, I had to go to work. And I was working, so I worked, as soon as I went to uh, Manpower, and they sent me to this place sewing to do. There were a lot of jobs for sewing. So I have to take because we have a mortgage to pay. And uh, one way just wasn't going to be, you know, enough to have all the luxury that you want. So we, I worked and that was coming every you work. And then a few months later, they lay you off and then, you know, they go again. Uh, you know, to the job, and it wasn't that pleasant. I said to myself, well, I'd like to go to have a, you know, change my career, change my, uh, you know, to do something else. And when I was laid off, and at that, that time they used to pay you about uh, almost 50 weeks unemployment. And there were almost uh, one week, two weeks left, 
that I said I was looking for a job I couldn't find. And uh, I thought, I'll go take two courses to learn something. I went and the uh, manpower near us and uh, the manager, she was uh, a lady. And uh, I, uh, you know, asked her, she said, oh, Mrs. Denkai, you had your weeks and you have one more week left. And, uh, you know, that's all you can have and you have time. But I guess I can't. I wanted, you know, to have something better. Anyway, and uh, she wouldn't. So I was uh, really, you know, upset. I told her, I said, uh, we women vote for women to, have, uh, to help us when in, we are needed. Uh, where, where they need us, I mean, I mean, we need them to help us. So she, you know, she kept refusing me. And this is woman, she could take care of me. I still have a, I was in my 40, uh, yeah, almost 50, yes, 50. And uh, I should, uh, you know, she could take care of me. I had another few more years to, to work and do something. Uh, she wouldn't. So I said to her, I said, you know, do you women, I said, I'd like to see those women that they are wearing over $100 pair of shoes and uh, four or $500 outfit to come and sit on the sewing machine for eight hours. And the floor is all concrete floor. And this motor beside you on the machine, hot, in the summer, to work for just one week and see how they will feel. So anyway, she went and uh, got the uh, employment insurance. There were, there were two departments, one on manpower to find your job. The other one is they pay you your, you know, my, sorry, money. And uh, she said, you done, but I did my study. If they send me to school to take a course, they would pay me up to 100 some weeks over to, uh, yeah, three years, something like that, they would pay me while I'm going to school. So she said to you then, I said, no, if you send me to school to learn another, you know, skill, I could, uh, you know, you will be still, you know, paying me. So she went and got the uh, gentleman and he stood there and talking to me. And I said, yes, I can have a hundred some weeks still so he went in and then they went together she came she said to me you know rebecca you could be a salesperson i said no i cannot be salesperson i could be something else to help people to you know i want to go into economics but i didn't know <laughs> i have to go so anyway they said okay you can go to school they said gave me paper i ran to the school I said, but uh, I am gonna lose the, if I go on Monday, my, my pay is finishing on uh, Friday. Uh, she said, don't worry. She said, I'll, I'll write there that you have started a week ago school. So that way they cannot, uh, you know, stop you. So I did and I got it. And then uh, what else was happening? So anyway, I went to school. I went to school, there's the only so many courses you can take when you are unemployed, you know, to learn another skills. So there is accounting, there is typing, so uh, uh, computer. So I had to take it, otherwise I'm gonna lose everything. Anyway, I took it, but I said, can I go into the another class take English? And said, no, that's not for you people, only for you, that's what it is. I said, well, debit and credit. How would I know what is meaning debit, what's meaning credit, or do the income statement? I said, if I don't know English, how can I, uh, you know, take these courses? So anyway, with my sons, my, ha my husband, they were <laughs> helping me. Uh, I used to <laughs> sit until two o'clock in the night uh, working, and my son, my husband used to send me, Oh, Rebecca, you are too tired, you have what? Get up, you know, leave it. And my son, he used to say, no, mom, you don't. Keep on going. So anyway, I did. I took the bookkeeping. <laughs> I took the computer, 
that time was apple, you know, the when you have to put this in. So anyway, that's what I did. And I got the job. I got the job right uh, at the Bloor and Spadina Toronto Volunteer Center. That's where I have so many pictures with the uh, Lieutenant Governor at the Queen's Park when we used to do appreciation of the volunteer. I used to do recru uh, recruiting the volunteers, uh, you know, uh, people that they would do the volunteer work. And in the end, sometimes end up a job for them. At the same time, they are learning something. So it was good. I was contract one year, but she kept me for 13 years. She kept me and I had a good pension also given from them and you know, they were so good to me. And uh, some of them, I still see them. We have a, you know, coffee together. Uh, but I had to, I was working still part-time as well at Sears. I worked for 23 years part-time, yes. And uh, when my son said, no, you don't need to work another, you know, another job. I said, no, I will work another job. I, have, I am able to help somebody, I will keep working. I am managing my ho housework, everything. I will continue working. So I continue working. And uh, so now, even I found by myself, nobody helped me, nobody, uh, sort of uh, introduced me for like volunteers, I mean this uh, Rexdale Community Center. Uh, I found it myself. This uh, Rexdale Community Center, uh, Health Community Center, I didn't even know they were existing in that area. So anyway, I did come here. So I'm so happy that, uh, you know, I am here and they have opened the door for us as senior. Uh, one thing I want to say, don't ever give up. No matter how old you are, you keep going and you, you look for it, you'll find it. Even if you don't have anyone to help you, you just, and this is what I did. I looked, I find it. I worked, I didn't retire until I was over 70 years old. I kept working, of course, full-time job, no. The part-time, I was still putting about uh, 25, 30, uh, 30 hours a week. So uh, that's where I am now. And coming from different background into different country, different language, but I think, I don't know, I become strong. And uh, I didn't give up. I just kept going and I am still going. I'm <laughs> How far, I don't know. <laughs> How far, I don't know, <laughs> but I will keep going. I won't stop and uh, try to help people and try people to learn from other what they have been doing. I mean, coming different language, different culture, different, but I adopted. I came to Canada from England. We didn't have a, a Thanksgiving there in England. We didn't have a Halloween. Uh, now I think they have a little bit something there. Uh, but I adopted to it. the first year. I kept doing Halloween. I kept doing well in the, uh, uh, Thanksgiving. I just adopt with the you know what the country are doing it. I do it. So even in our community, people they didn't do it, but I did it. So I was you know, just going with the flow. So <laughs> how much more I can say? And uh, also my uh, kids, they listen to me. Not that, uh, I mean, they did good uh, with their education. They are well, uh, you know, uh, established. Uh, I am very happy for that. And uh, they make sure I am okay. And, uh, but we stood, me and my husband, we stood behind our kids. We, you know, they graduated and they're doing good. They're in the right track and they are supporting the uh, community. Even uh, my son now, I think, I don't know, he learned from me or just the nature. And he's, he's gonna, he's helping somebody that has come from uh, Iraq, that her own brothers and sister-in-law, they are not helping her. Now my son, he have to come from other side of the city to Etobicoke to take this person to the immigration 
to help her because there's no one to help her. So we try, we do our best, and we hope that everybody will do the same. Keep going, never, never stop learning. No, don't, we don't look the age, we look the, the where it's the, I can do better. Hi, my name is Sheila. I'm a member of the Seniors Program at Rexdale Community Center. And today I'm going to tell you my story. And my story is the moving of Mr. Beresford House from Grenada. When I was a young girl growing up in the Caribbean, it was not unusual to move your house from one destination to the other as most of the houses in the Caribbean were of a wooden structure. Some of the houses, the bottom would be of wall and the top mostly would be of a wooden structure. Um, sometimes, some houses, the downstairs would be walled and cased and the step would be on the outside and you do everything at the bottom of the house, the downstairs, and evening time, night time, you move upstairs which to the sleeping quarters. Some people, that was the only time they'll go back upstairs to the house. The whole day was spent at the downstairs. The moving was done mostly on Sundays as people worked from Monday to Saturday for a meager, meager wages. The owner of the house to be moved would go to the village and ask mostly the men to give her her hand in moving the house from one destination to the other. They would normally be paid with food and drinks, usually white rum. The women of the village did the cooking and it would be a lot of food. It would be pigeon pea soup, Pelau, which is made with rice and peas, and the had fowl, which we call yard fowl. It was big, fat during the day. There were beating of drums and singing and dancing. And the women and the men took this activity very seriously. They knew exactly what they had to do, when it had to do, and how it was being done. We as children was glad when their house was being moved from one destination to the other, as we knew there would be plenty food. And at that time, that was the only time you'll get a big piece of meat. Normally, you'll just get a sliver as usual too. But we look forward to it. There were dancing and mu music and beating of drum and everybody had a good time. The women of the village came very early in the morning with their colorful head tie and their matador, matador dresses to do the cooking. They'll be singing and dancing. And we all look forward to the time for when the food would be served. There would be beating of the drums and everybody had a good time. The men, they were professional in their work and they knew exactly what had to be done. They took the moving of the houses very seriously. Now, on that particular day, the moving of Mr. Beresford House, we had to go around the village to the town to go to the new destination where the house would be erected. The first load of the siding of the house, whatever it went well. But then the men started complaining as it took a longer time to go around the village. They decided to make a shortcut, which means they have to go through a dry river. 
No, this dry river is not like the ordinary dry river. It's just like, you'll see it flowing just like a stream. So you could easily pass with your load through the river to get, and that would cut the time in about 15 or 20 minutes. But on that day, it had rained in the mountains. And there was no rain in the village where we live, but the rain was in the mountain. <clears throat> now, instead of going through the town with the first load, they decided to take a shortcut by crossing a dry river. The river became to cross. One man slipped and the current began dragging him. One by one, the men started falling into the water with the load part of the house that they were carrying. There were a lot of screaming and bawling and shouting for help for the other people to come to help them. The other villagers came to their assistance. So to save the house and also to save the men from drowning. The house was floating away. They were screaming. They <laughs> The villagers came with ropes and whatever they had to save the side of the house that was floating away. After they were able to save the, the men and the side of the house, nearly the whole village was out at the river banks, pulling and tugging to get the men to safety. After the argument, the house was moved by the rest of the remainder of the house was moved on a flatbed truck to its destination, onto its new site. It was erected and Mr. Beresford and his family slept in the newly erected house that same night. Today, no one remembers how Mr. Beresford almost lost his house in the river. And the motto of my story is, Cutting corners to save time does not always work. It was nice growing up for me in the in the West Indies, but in Grenada, I should say. Every all islands have their own culture and what difficult. My mother was strict in that sense. Not like here with the teenagers where you're free, you have boyfriend and those. No, you couldn't have that. You couldn't have that. My mother used to say, I'm sending you to the shop and don't let me spit and let it get dry before you come back. And it's true, Alison used to run to get where you're going because you know when you're coming back, you're taking the longer walk to come back home. But it, it was good. Things we didn't have, the things like we have, my children had at that age, and I'm always reminded. I said, you know, I told them, when I was growing up, I didn't have a doll. I didn't have, my godfather was a masonry, he made me a doll bed, and I did. You know what I had for a doll? A corn stick. The corn on the cob, when it dry, and you shell it out, and you tease the rest of the street and plant the hair. You, that's how you learn to sew, make doll clothes and things like that. But it was good, you didn't know any better. So you look forward for Christmas, you would get a little toy and maybe a little, a little dress, not, well, not all the time a dress because it didn't come by easy, yeah. but for sure, a balloon, a <laughs> pair of socks, and those, but you appreciated it, you were glad, you were happy. Things were rough. My mother was a single mother, but um, you know, she, we, we all, everybody lived in the same big house. Brothers, sisters, cousin, and aunts, and everybody did. That's how we grew up. So it was extended family as well. So we grew up like that. And I try like, I, just tell my, I always tell my, I say, boy, when you were growing up, we didn't have, I say, oh, mom, she said, well, you want some to post? to send for them. I said, no, I say, you guys. I said, but it's good. It couldn't be like that all the time. Change had to come. You appreciated everything you had. And yes, and that was it here. Yeah.
with all the thing in Ukraine and all those things, one day I was just saying, I said, you know, this song just suits what is going on. When I saw the pictures of the old people, they don't want to leave their home. They cry. They're so used to it being in there all these years and all of a sudden they have, they don't want to leave. They want to stay in the country. They want to die for the country. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Ooh, imagine there's no country. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for And no religion to Imagine all the people Living life in peace Ooh, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions I wonder if you can No need for greed or hunger A brotherhood of mine Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Ooh, 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 you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope and pray that you'll join us and the world will live as one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
repostería. El colegio tenía varias opciones para poder seguir una carrera técnica y yo elegí repostería. Pero llegó un momento que lo dejé. Ingresé, postulé a la Universidad Católica, donde ingresé a la Facultad de Educación en la Especialidad de Educación Primaria. Terminando mi carrera, me gradué, inicié mi carrera magisterial, profesional ya, yendo a trabajar a una comunidad llamada Oquibamba, en la provincia de Espinar, Cusco. Cuando yo llegué allá, tenía que viajar en un camión, pero quiero recalcar que yo ya tenía una hija, mi hijita, que ya ya que tenía dos años, entonces con ella me fui a trabajar. Entonces tuve que viajar en un camión con ella, agarradas a, en la parte de atrás, no adelante. Cuando llegamos sentía que el viento, el viento, el frío, la paja, ahí crece paja porque es puna. Entonces yo sentía que silbaba esa paja. Nos bajamos, la escuela estaba, la escuela eh, estaba en el centro, las casas eran dispersas, unas por allá, otras por allá, y por allá el cementerio. En la escuela había la vivienda para los profesores. Yo no sabía qué hecho, no sabía nada. Entonces, los niños no, no me comprendían. Para ambos fue una experiencia nueva. Me propuse enseñarles a ellos el castellano. Y las mujeres se vestían con estos sombreros, con sus faldas. Este traje es el traje del Valle de los Volcanes, es del Colca. Y también lo utilizaban en el Valle de los Volcanes. Es tradicional. Esto. Este sombrero está hecho de, del cuero de las ovejas, de las llamas. Por eso podemos hacerlo así y no pasa nada. En la lluvia, igual forma. Y es caliente. Tanto en el lugar de las alturas donde estuve, utilizaban el, esa clase de, de sombreros que les protegía, más su chullo. Estaban siempre calientitos. Fue un proyecto que me logró, tuve lo llevé a un concurso logrando el primer puesto en un evento nacional y que me llenó no solamente a mí sino a todo el personal que trabajaba en ese tiempo conmigo una experiencia muy hermosa que dejamos como huellas siguiendo mis desafíos pues me volví a presentar a otro concurso del PELA en el año 2010 ahí pude capacitar ser acompañante de las profesoras, de las directoras y de los niños. Fue una experiencia novedosa. Y el 2012, pues cesé porque mi hija se casó, tuve, nació mi nieto y tuve que venirme a Canadá. Acá en Toronto, con mis miedos y temores, pues todo me daba miedo, no sabía el inglés, no sabía caminar, eh, ir a, sola por la calle. Entonces mi hija, ella me inscribió, me matriculó en un instituto de inglés y yo no sabía nada. No podía comunicarme con nadie porque todos hablaban el inglés muy avanzado. Y un día yo estaba sentadita y vino una amiga, María de Cuba, y me dijo, ¿qué haces acá? Tu hija está perdiendo tiempo. Vamos, te voy a llevar y me llevó a un community center donde me acogieron y comencé a aprender inglés. Eh, ahí conocí a varias personas. Después de un tiempo de cuatro años, pasé a integrar el grupo al grupo de Casa Cultural Peruana de Danzas, eh, difundiendo el folclore, las tradiciones, cultura y costumbres del Perú. Cuando yo me sentía sola, me acordaba de todas las cosas que hacía y comenzaba a cantar esta canción que dice 
pero yo la voy, no la voy a cantar, sino la voy a hablar como un recuerdo. Las locas ilusiones me sacaron de mi pueblo. Abandoné mi casa para ver la capital. Como recuerdo el día, feliz de mi partida, sin reparar en nada, de mi tierra me alejé. Mi, y mientras que mi madre, muy triste y sollozando, me decía, hija mía, llévate mi bendición. Luché como mujer y pude conseguir, alcanzando el anhelo de vivir con todo su esplendor, en medio de esta dicha me atormenta la nostalgia del pueblo que dejé oh, mi corazón. Es muy triste esta canción porque refleja lo mío, lo que dejé, pero logré otra cosa, ese anhelo que hoy Estoy acá. Un día conocí también Rechtel. Ahí me recibieron con las puertas abiertas, donde estuvo Wendy, Marilia, Miriam, Del. Eh, bueno, el profesor de, de inglés, Dan, Susi, y mucha, mucha gente linda donde me enseñaron muchas cosas abriéndome la puerta. También seguí un curso de fotografía y actualmente continúo con Carlos y Gloria Castaño. He seguido un curso de autobiografía y autorretrato con Camila y, y Alicia. Ellas me incentivaron a lo que hoy estoy haciendo escribir, a escribir toda esa, esa gama de experiencias que estuvo olvidada en mí para volverlas a revivir. Por eso mi abuela decía, en la vida se, se gana ni se pierde, no se gana ni se pierde, ni se fracasa ni se triunfa, en la vida se aprende, se crece, se descubre, se escribe, se borra y se vuelve a escribir. Se hila, se deshila y se vuelve a hilar. El día que comprendí que lo único que me voy a llevar es lo que vivo. Y entonces empecé a vivir lo que me voy a llevar. Gracias. I, my name is Almi Dikuna. I was born in Uganda in March 1936. Uh, 86 years ago and we were four brothers and three sisters and at the, in 1945 just before the end of World War II my dad who worked for the British government in the British civil service uh, he was not keeping good health and at the age of 53 he decided to go back to Goa, India uh, which was uh, surprising because at that time the war had not ended and the Japanese were torpedoing ships and a couple of people in my village died in one of the ships that were torpedoed. I don't know why dad took his chance because one month after we arrived in Goa, the war ended, uh, World War II. So Goa is uh, one of the smallest states in India it's the honeymoon capital of India because it's a lot like Jamaica. And so I did my high school there and I did some shortened typing to equip me to take on a job. And at the age of 17, I saw my dad was struggling to maintain the family financially. 
So I said, one mouth less to take care of. So at the age of 17, I went back to Uganda and worked for the uh, British government at that time in 1953 till 1972. In 1962, Uganda got its independence from the British government. And when the British members of the civil service left, all, most of the civil service jobs were held by Goans because all the three governors said all the keys to the safe were in the hands of Goans because of their strict couple, Catholic, Roman Catholic upbringing. They were very honest and you could trust them with every penny. So. So we worked there, we, and then we all got promoted. We filled in the jobs that the British took because at that time it was like the British were on top, the Indians, Pakistanis were in the middle, and the Africans who owned the country were right at the bottom, which was not fair. But uh, So we had, from 1962 to 1972, we had a wonderful lifestyle. Uh, we used to go to work at 8 o'clock, come back at 12.30 and we used to have our meals served on the table, have a half an hour siesta, go back to work at 2, come back at 4 and uh, we had clubs where we used to play foot, football, soccer, hockey, field hockey, cricket, table tennis, tennis. It was beautiful at 9 o'clock we used to have a couple of drinks at the bar and then go home and we used to be served dinner. So it was a, the word stress didn't exist. It was a simple life, not, not sophisticated. We had only two movie houses in the city. But in 72, Idi Amin decided to expel all the Indians, Pakistanis. And he gave us 90 days notice to get out of the country. And Canada was very generous to take us in as refugees. So on the plane, on the Air Canada flight, uh, my son tapped me and said, Dad, thanks for the present. I said, what present? Because I was all tense and anxious. We just packed our bags overnight, left our house with all the furniture. And he said, oh, my birthday. And it was his sixth birthday. When we arrived in Canada at the Montreal airport, the Minister of Immigration welcomed us. And uh, the next day, in his welcoming speech, he said, when he was appointed Ministry of, Minister of Immigration, he never thought he would have the honor and privilege to welcome us. And most of us broke down. I still remember. Sorry. But we were in the news and we were faced with battery of reporters and they asked me what I did. And I said I was a senior auditor I was not qualified, but as a glorified bookkeeper. So as the immigration officer was processing my papers, she gets a call from a chartered accountant company saying they want to hire Mr. Dikuna. No interview or nothing. And so I worked for them. They were very, very good to me. But chartered accountant firms don't pay well. But it, I was managed, able to put food on the table, pay for accommodation and pay for all our basic needs. But two weeks later, a friend of mine said, look, uh, he knows of another position in another company. And so I went for the interview and they were paying me 50% more than what the chartered accountant. Now how to tell, it was a very small company of 10 people. I was the least qualified among all this because the, the rest were all BCom students studying to be chartered accountants. So I don't know how to tell, I was so, uh, I don't know, I couldn't have the heart to tell him that I've, I'm quitting. But he was very good. He says, are you sure you're doing the right thing? I said, yeah, you know, it's paying me so much more. He said, no, we can't pay you that. But he said, if you have any problems, come back, which was excellent. And when I joined the company, uh, this is so bad, the, the position I was going to fill was occupied by a French Canadian woman who was qualified, who did a BCom, very smart, very uh, chick. <laughs> but she had met with an accident and why, I don't know whether the president was 
uh, didn't like women or I don't know. So he, after he interviewed me and said, okay, I'll pay you $125 a week, which was okay then, 50% more than what I was getting there. And I came to know that this uh, lady who was fluently bilingual, who had a degree, was getting only $100 a month. And so he told her to hire me at 125 and to train me. And she's, I didn't know the Canadian system of all this. She sat next to me, walked for two weeks and trained me completely. And then she left. She was very good to me. And I, I had a few problems like the taxes and all that. So she said, call her anytime. So I called her once. She, she guided me. Next time I called, the husband picked up the phone and he said, you've taken my wife's job and you're asking for help. And I said, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, you know. So I, I put the phone down and I apologized to him. She calls me back and she apologizes. I said, I'm, human beings are so wonderful. But it was a small company with no benefits and nothing. And then my brother, who used to work for the LCBO here in Toronto, said, there's an opening when you come. So I came down and got a job at the LCBO, where I worked for 23 years till I retired. Yeah. And Canada has been the best place in all the country. For all the people in my own community, we have about 40,000 of us here. We have five clubs where we socialize dances, uh, dinners and all that. We have a very active social life. And when we have funerals, at least there are three, four hundred people that attend funerals, yeah. Followed by a reception, yeah. So can Canada has been the best country I could have come to. Yeah, yeah. So a friend of mine, Michael Fernandez, told me about this RCHC and so I joined them and, and that's another wonderful thing that's happened to me. The staff, they're so dedicated, uh, Marila, Sajita, Tanya, uh, forget some other names, Wendy, yeah, yeah. And all the people who walk us through the exercise program, like Alison, <laughs> uh, Dale Moran, uh, Susie, and who's the other one? Uh, uh, Shireen, <laughs> Shireen, who does a yoga class. How long have you been with Rexdale? I think six months, I think. And oh, just six months? Yeah, okay. yeah. And I feel so much. It's improved my health and my sense of well-being and the social aspect of meeting people from different ethnic backgrounds. It's been a wonderful experience. I've had like one day I forgot to put my old shoes and I was waiting for, for the bus stop and my feet were frozen yeah that was that was the not so nice part of Canada because <laughs> in Uganda we had 72 degrees year-round with passing showers yeah I was getting out of the uh, we moved into a modest uh, accommodation and fortunately the bus stop to go to work was just outside the door uh, outside the house but from the door to the bus stop it was icy and I fell down and uh, I was struggling to get up and two women picked me up. <laughs> yeah. My wife and I and two other couples, we, we did the East Coast. We flew to Moncton and we hired a van and we traveled all the way to uh, Nova Scotia, PI, Newfoundland. And the next time we did the same thing, we flew to Calgary, uh, Calgary uh, rented a car and went to Edmonton, Jasper Park, uh, Vancouver.
work hard, study hard, and go to church because <laughs> you need God in your life. Yeah. I would say place God first thing in your life and everything will be granted to you. I am Sramika Ghosh. My uh, first, my story is my first journey to Canada. I born and raised at Domjur. That time it was a small village, and on the outskirt of Calcutta's sister city, Howrah, in West Bengal, India. My family uh, was made for us six siblings, two brothers and four sisters. All are well educated. As my father in inspiration and he, he loved to value of education and which inspired us and we learned so many things from him. My father was a dedicated doctor in our community. He believed the honest hard work. My mother also a, uh, educated and she sacrificed a lot. She was down to earth lady and also she uh, very um, uh, hard worker for our family and we obtained a happy family home. At that time, I was a teacher, full-time teacher in a school, high school, and in West Bengal. That teaching time, my father uh, proposed me that a um, pot potential marriage would be match for me. And then uh, he, one of men who is coming from Canada, and that family was eager to arrange the marriage. And within a week, our marriage was settled and happened everything with a sense of palpable excitement. And as I am the first person of my family coming to Canada and live abroad. My, uh, after our wedding, and we had to do so many procedures and we have to prepare our, uh, all the arrangement to come to Canada. Like um, the arrange for the passport, applied for the visa, and go to the travel agency and travel for um, arrange that my flight tickets, and also I have to submit my resignation for my full time school job. After. He went, my husband went to, in India for three weeks only. His holiday ended and he came back to Canada. As my, um, as my visa delayed and I had no choice, I have to come alone in India. That time, the agency uh, agent informed me, travel agent informed me that you have to go, oh, that there is no direct flight from Calcutta to Canada. You have to change three times and three different flight. And the duration time is 35 hours. 
uh, my travel agent informed me your destination uh, time settle uh, to um, I have to come uh, that the 7th of January 1975 anyway I was stood at the airport that day and both my families friends and relatives were there to see me off and I had a feelings of being a starlet of India Indian cinema <laughs> and and I have to um, I felt it was like a dream. After that, I was sitting alone and so many worries, weariness pile up in my mind. And I thought that, how can I recognize my husband? Uh, because I didn't see him correctly and then if he forgot to come to the airport, then what will be then? Then I was thinking that way as because I had to add in so many things and uh, to immigrate to Canada, to arrange everything. After that, again, this flight pilot also, a flight for British Airways, the pilot announced that, that this flight already touched the ground. We didn't realize from the first class at all, you know. Then I, then December on the plane, from the plane and I uh, came out and I was looking for and proceeded myself to that uh, uh, exit sign, follow the exit sign. But that time I was so anxious and I was watching that one and most of the one or two oh, mm, that running staircase constantly I never seen that the staircase can run that way in my life you know then I was thinking that how can I get in because that staircase is moving. Take a courage in my mind and then I jump on the staircase and without any making any disturbance or problem, I made, made it. I didn't think that how can I get out from that running <laughs> staircase. But I have no choice. I was perplexed. And then I thought that, that it would be the best way, the big jump. Then I made it and successfully. As I had two heavy bags on my carry-on bags, make me that uh, imbalance and I fall down on the floor and after that I saw that opposite side there was a, a glass wall and so many people were standing there and one man was laughing and I thought it must be my husband. I was so upset, but I controlled my mind. Then I proceed f 
for the final paper job for custom clearance and I followed the I find out that the my custom clearance decks I did I declare everything and without hesitation I got the permit to go out from that customs then I came for um, pick up a trolley and took bo keep both of my hand luggage and then pick up my suitcases and proceeded towards the outside of the gate then I one thing came in my mind I will not use the English word I should use the mother tongue because if he uh, responds the mother tongue then uh, mother language also then I will be correct that that is that my husband one man was proceeded towards me and he I asked him in my language and I was correct that is the man my husband we re 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 reunion and make my make our uh, started our family in Canada successfully Future is that uh, nobody can tell the uh, correct one. The future is a dream, or future is a uh, not correct way prediction. We cannot do that. But according to my guidance, I raise them. Now their decision, they what they will do or not. That is not my part of my responsibility. Uh, I gave them, I gave them the education, and they are now free for that. Uh, uh, they are make it own. So you take your education and you make your own path. Yeah. My name is Esther Oyewumi. I'm a Nigerian by birth, but now I'm a Canadian. <laughs> my story, the story of my life and my trip to Canada. I was born in 1951, March. Uh, I'm, I'm the fourth position, I'm in the first position in my family, my, the children of my family. So, uh, my father was a farmer and he loves me so much and promised me to send me to school at any level. level. So, but when I was eight years old, he died. And that is when my story changed. I couldn't go to school. When I was nine years old, I started doing uh, maid work for people. I worked for people. Some of them treated me well. Some of them treated me like a slave. I learned about life in a hard way. I go through a lot. I go through many things till I was um, age of getting married. I got married, I, I still go through a lot. 
So some people helped me to come to Canada. When I was coming, my son followed me to the airport. And that was my first time of going, traveling with airplane. I was so nervous. I was shaking. My, husband, my son was looking at me. Mommy, what happened? Why are you shaking? Did you carry cocaine? <laughs> <laughs> I was, because I don't know, only him and my, the person who is bringing me here knew about my coming here. So inside the plane, I was nervous. Even the person beside me knew that I was nervous. So when they wanted to serve food, you know, being the first time, I only eat Nigerian food. I don't know anything about a vegetable or something. Though we eat fresh food from farm. So they said, what do, did I want? I said, chicken or vegetable? I said, I want chicken. I thought they would just put chicken on uh, the type of food I eat. And <laughs> so when they brought the food, I saw broccoli. I saw. A vegetable, I saw small rice. <laughs> you know, in, in, in Nigeria, we eat plenty. But I saw small rice, saw vegetables, saw chicken. I was just looking at it. So I saw the broccoli. I said, ah, what is this? How can they put tree inside their food? It's like tree, because I've never seen broccoli before. Though I couldn't eat it because it was my first time of seeing that type of thing. <laughs> and so the, when we got here, I was so, inside the plane, I saw people dressing up, wearing sweater. I only wear something light from Nigeria. I don't know anything. So when I saw them dressing up, wearing coat, wearing jacket, I, when I came down, I just go, when I come out, uh, uh, water was coming out from my eyes, it coming out from my nose, and it was freezing. I was shaking. Uh, what is this? So they took me to the church. So I started anywhere I want to go. When I came here, eventually, I go with interpreter because I, I didn't go to school. I only learned a little English from the people I live with. So. I went to Costi School. I was the smallest in stature, but I was the um, oldest person in the class. But all my teacher loves me. They encouraged me. Then uh, they, they, they asked me, they encouraged me to set my goal. I was even want to go to high school. After that, I enrolled to uh, York Day Adult Learning Center. I was there like a year before I fell down on the snow. I couldn't go again. So when I was feeling okay, I started volunteering. I volunteer at a Chalk Farm Community Center. I volunteer in the church. And that is when I come to Rexdale Community Health Center. When I came there, I, they write my name, they, say, they give me some form to fill and do, did many things. So I started uh, volunteering in the kitchen. And uh, later they asked me to participate in a senior program. So Wendy was is a very good person. And all the people in the kitchen there, they are like my family. They loved me, Miriam, Tanya, and uh, Rupa. They, I was surrounded by lovely people. They are just like my family. But sometimes when you think about what happened at the past, there is no way you cannot think about it. When my son called me, I will started crying because I couldn't be with him. And he will be encouraging me, Mommy, don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. So, 
uh, I was, sometimes I was so to, depressed that uh, I tell my story to Wendy. She took it upon herself to give me food every day. Even when I finish in the kitchen, she will pack the food I will eat for dinner for me. Everyone, I was surrounded with lovely, with people, good people. I love them. I love them and I pray that uh, God will show them favor. Wherever they go, they receive favor. And uh, in Canada here, they received me. The government of Canada received me. They take care of me. I like them. I, in my, back in my country, that wouldn't happen. Even if you don't have anything, a person can die on hunger. If not, so I, will, I don't know where I would be today. I don't know. But God showed me favor. And I, 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 when I pray to God, I, I pray to God to, to take my life as an example to my enemy, as a surprise to my enemy, as an example to people. Because the, I thought there, we are, we are, I think there is no way God passed away for me. We are there, the, 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 I think, there is, the door has closed, God opened the door for me. And I was surrounded by good people. I want to say thank you to the government of Canada, to all the people that so, they helped me. And the, my family I have in Red Zay Community Center. And the staff and everyone in the health center for the good job, for the great work they are doing. I really, really appreciate them and God bless them. To not lose their faith, just have hope and determine to become someone. Because I don't know how to read, I don't know how to write. But when I come to Canada, I determine to do something. I go everywhere with interpreter. I, I don't have privacy. I go to hospital, I go to immigration, everywhere I go that they speak for me. But I determine that I don't want that. So I go to ESA class. I started learning English. Here I am today. <laughs> that is when I have a arthritis because I, I, in my country there is no cold weather. We go everywhere, only rain. And uh, but when I come here during the winter, wow, I couldn't go out. When I go out, I, I, I no matter how many clothes I wear, I still feel the cold. So. It's not the same with uh, Africa. So. And how do you eat broccoli now? And it's <laughs> 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 Even like, every day I eat broccoli. I, I prepared it myself. <laughs> little trees. Yes, little trees. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you keep yourself happy. You make yourself happy because nobody can make you happy. You make sure you eat healthy, you keep yourself happy and make sure you exercise so you can be healthy. <laughs>